Oftentimes, the way it goes in the video game industry, once a current generation hardware set is released, work on the next gen gets right underway. That's especially true if said game machine is a hit. That certainly was the case with NEC and Hudson. They first collaborated in 1987 to produce the PC Engine, which was pretty popular right from the start. The PC Engine was upgraded a year later with a CD-ROM-ROM attachment, which then paved the way for an all-new hardware system, the Super Graphics, in 1989. The new machine also caused the original PC Engine to be rebranded as the Core Graphics to differentiate the two, while showing that they belong to the same family. The Super Graphics was technically superior to the PC Engine, but it was only technically, technically superior. The upgrade wasn't so spectacular. A few Super Graphics games actually worked on the PC Engine, and it wasn't the leap forward many were hoping for. Combine that with the popularity of the PC Engine slash Core Graphics, and NEC and Hudson probably made the right move by letting the Super Graphics die out and focus on the current generation, upgrading the CD-ROM-ROM to Super Status, putting the Core Graphics and CD into one unit called the Duo, and upgrading it one more time with the arcade card. But while all of that was happening, NEC and Hudson, behind the scenes, were working on the true next-gen successor to the PC Engine. In 1990, work began on the 32-bit machine, codenamed Tetsujin, Iron Man in English. The project was worked on for two years, mostly in secret. But by 1992, the machine was reported to be ready to roll. A true 32-bit machine with a CD-ROM and possible future expandability. The only problem was that the PC Engine was still a hot seller with a lot of life left in it. Rather than repeat the super graphics situation all over again, NEC and Hudson sat on Iron Man and waited. 92 became 93, and then 94, as rumors circulated in the back pages of magazines of the on-again, off-again nature of Iron Man. With Sony, Sega, and others ready for 32 bits, NEC and Hudson finally released the PCFX on December 23, 1994. What consumers got was a rather unique piece of kit, a vertical tower, similar to a desktop computer, complete with expansion slots, as well as a six-button controller, which by 94 was expected and the industry standard. The machine sold for 49,800 yen, over 500 US dollars at the time. The high price and lack of popularity of the TurboGrafx-16 kept the PCFX locked away in Japan. NEC and Hudson were caught off guard with the coming sea change and left with no choice but to stand by a configuration that was several years old and behind the competition. That choice meant that PCFX games were lackluster compared to those of the Saturn, PlayStation, and even 3DO. PCFX games were all in 2D, while 3D was becoming the standard. There was, however, one standout technical feature of the PCFX, the ability to output video directly from the CD-ROM, bypassing the CPU, which led to amazing, high-quality 2D graphics. In an era before DVDs, these were amazing. In a way, it made perfect sense at the onset, as the most popular PC Engine CD-ROM-ROM titles featured lots and lots of animated cutscenes with spoken audio, often from popular anime series, and sometimes were original. So to continue on that trend would have been great, but the world had other plans. The move to 3D was on, and in the end, it really did provide a much better experience than games that used full motion video. 2D was still popular, but there was already an established market for that, the PC Engine being a major part of it. This left the PCFX trapped between eras, without a place to call its own. Many of the popular licensed properties that made the PC Engine great were absent on the PCFX, with most third-party publishers moving to the PlayStation. In the end, only 62 games were released for the PCFX between December 1994 and April 1998. Some of these games were also available on the PlayStation, Saturn, and Super Famicom, which certainly didn't help matters. Funnily enough, for almost the entire time the PCFX was on sale, PC Engine games were still being released. The best style of game the PCFX could handle were roleplay, simulation, and visual novels, with bright, colorful graphics, high-quality voiceovers, and tons of text menus. As a result, the PCFX library requires a high level of Japanese, there were a few games that are playable for all, like Chip Chan Kick, 
Emulation is possible nowadays, so why not give it a try? The PCFX, despite its unpopularity, managed to have one interesting upgrade, the PCFX GA, which stands for Game Adapter. Don't forget that the PC and PC Engine and PCFX links NEC's home game business with its computer business. NEC had been selling home computers for almost a decade before the PC Engine, and the PC 8800 and 9800 series were very popular back then. And with some models, the PC Engine CD player would work with these computers. The PC FX GA allowed certain PC 9800 series computers to run PC FX games. It also worked on DOS V machines, which were IBM clones available in Japan. The expansion ports built into the PCFX also allowed for some connectivity to PC9800 computers, including using the PCFX as the computer's CD-ROM drive. Oh, and the PCFX also played CDGs, which was a semi-popular format in Japan, as well as photo CDs, which never really caught on. In the end, the price, the limited hardware, and the style of game that the PCFX was limited to sealed its fate. The machine only sold about 110,000 units over the three and a half years it was active, though NEC actually manufactured 400,000, meaning that most PCFXs were never sold and sat in warehouses unused. Even though a number of PCFX games were available elsewhere, the visual novel type of game faded away by the end of the 90s. Sure, some games popped up here and there, but for the most part, the genre migrated to PCs, where 18 plus age restrictions were lighter and hardware specs weren't so demanding. You could argue that in the pre-Windows 95 world, the PCFX played a vital role in establishing home for that genre. And coincidentally or not, looking like a PC and having some PC compatibility might have helped migrate the genre over there and away from the home TV game. An interesting relic of the crossroads where gaming evolved and matured into what they are today.